weekend, who is a CU graduate. In fact, uh, she left here about the time I came here, I think, or just a little before that. And like many of us, has, has spent her life in musicology doing other important historical things, only to discover, as Professor Swain and Kay and myself have, have come to thinking what an important thing that we are now uh, you know, engaged in with the, the brain, the brain body, the music, the music brain, the, the non-music brain. Give the time uh, on it. Yeah, it was no. all happening at the same time. So uh, again, uh, the, her biography, impressively uh, written as it is, is uh, for your available for your perusal in the printed program. Uh, I'm very pleased to present uh, that's Professor K. Norton. done this in a lot of different situations and it's always great. Um, what it wasn't that inspiring this morning. Um, I grew up in the state of Georgia and I grew up, um, I was born in 1956, so by the time I got to high school we were fully integrated and I have to tell you it wasn't just the music that was attractive about the black kids. We wanted to be like them. We wanted to be like them uh, in humor, in joy of living, in the sense of style even as outsiders, um, and certainly in music. And I think, um, if you think you know, and I'm not really uh, addressing the panel, but those of you in the room, if you think you get the whole story of the Deep South, um, it's really complicated, as these ladies, uh, as these fine scholars pointed out. Um, and it, uh, one of the things I've worked on is the spiritual, and it was so, so inspirational to be able to sing with you together. We're going to sing one more that they didn't sing. Actually, it's not spiritual, but um, you'll know why in just a minute. I want to, it seems appropriate for me to tell you just a little bit about myself. Um, I was an Amer I came here and worked on American music with Bill Kearns. Those of you who have been around long enough to know Bill. Uh, I'm having lunch with him today, so I'll tell him you said hello. Uh, and Sophia. And, um, and then uh, in 1996, I was teaching at the University of Missouri, Kansas City at the conservatory there. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. And um, I was invited to uh, be on a team talk group uh, that taught a course called um, um, Healing in the Arts. And it was with two cardiologists, hematologists, uh, an art historian, a music historian, me, and uh, a theater historian. And, and so that got me started. That was the spring of 1996, and we had a Culpeper Foundation grant. Um, there was a, there's a medical humanities office at the med school at UMKC, and Marjorie Searage was, uh, founded that, and she invited me, and it really changed my life. And then um, my dad died uh, six months later. And uh, it, I, I was struck very strongly with the fact that um, what I was doing with my life didn't seem as important anymore is the fact that all that I knew about music didn't make his life uh, easier the last six months when he was in a lot of pain. So um, I got sort of transformed into this person who, I was working on sacred music, and I, I, it became a very short step to think about sacred music and to think about um, how music is good for you. And um, through that process, since then, my mother had a stroke two years ago, I have one sibling, She's completely out of the picture, so I'm standing in the Georgia hospital and somebody walks out and says, she can't live alone anymore. And I, you know, like I was raised, I said, well, here I am. Okay, he called my husband and said, mama's coming home with us. He said, okay, we'll work it out. So uh, she lived with us for a year and um, now she lives in a wonderful senior living center. I volunteer uh, and sing songs with them uh, once a month. I give my mother a shower twice a week. Um, and that's just, uh, and I guess one more thing, so you know how I, uh, I crossed over from musicology. Um, also in 1997, <clears throat> um, a few months after my dad died, I was privileged to become the mother of a child who was born in Russia and spent the first nine months of her life in a Russian orphanage. So um, I have become this insatiable person about uh, getting other people to figure out what we know about the inherent power of music and how being a horn player 
has helped my daughter with language and self-esteem and you name it. It has reorganized her brain. She was in a baby house for nine months um, when she came to us. And um, I think it is music and singing in church and having a singing mother and um, a, a music girl conductor father. And uh, I think that music has made that transmission, transition to our family, our culture, uh, much better for her. So uh, if you ever wonder how somebody who is a musicologist and had a great education at CU, how, how I veered off into this direction. I can't imagine my life going in any other uh, uh, direction and me be the least bit um, persuasive. Uh, I, I just can't talk about music as an ex outside of how it makes you feel anymore. I'm in the middle of a book, uh, almost finished actually. The first three chapters are about the brain. I really want this to be a uh, textbook for medical humanities uh, courses in medical schools. I like, could, would you raise your hand if you're a music therapist? Are there any therapists in the room? That's okay if it's like that. Uh, do you ever volunteer, do you volunteer with children uh, and sing with them? Do you volunteer with uh, senior adults? Do you volunteer with at-risk populations? Uh, do you volunteer with people who have dementia? Do you ever sit down and say, well, do you feel like singing something? You ever sung with somebody bedside? Okay, so I'm tired of talking to physicians. The day after my mother's stroke, they said, well, she'll start walking again. She'll start talking again. It was a left hemorrhagic, left hemisphere, her hemorrhagic stroke, and suddenly she couldn't talk anymore. She was driving, couldn't figure out how to put the car in park. And so I got there as soon as I could, and the doctor said, she'll walk. She'll get to it. It's not that bad a stroke. And so I was spent the night in the room with her, and I said, they want you to walk. And she said, okay. And so she stood up, and thank God I had read um, Oliver Sacks. I had hung out with the right music therapists, and I knew about gait rhythm and Parkinson's, and I said, okay. She was like, nothing was happening. And they said, well, she will, she will. And, and so I said, okay, we're going to sing, Onward Christian Soldiers. And so I started swaying, she did, she walked to the bathroom. And I was like, yes! You know, and then um, I got her back, and then she couldn't do anything, but she, could, uh, she couldn't speak. And so I was speaking for her, as we do for our parents, and I said, can you sing happy birthday? She sang it front to back, top to bottom, happy birthday. Um, can you sing, can you say the alphabet, A to Z? Can you count to 20? Yes. So all those pattern things. So when the, Neuro, when the neurologist came out and said, guess what? I, and I told the nurses that they couldn't have been more or less impressed than if I had said, uh, I'm a witch doctor. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, like those therapists among us and those of us who have worked our entire careers, I'm tired of having the medical community go glazed over in the eyes when we talk about the power of music. So the first three chapters of my book are the, one of the ones you're going to hear today, part of the one, one about our, our voice, which is our first musical instrument, and then a chapter I love about the mother's voice and its power over us for the rest. This book is about the voice, about the melodious voice. And then my last chapters, one is on um, blues uh, and one is on uh, singing and dementia and one is on singing and believing. So the uh, major religions as well as uh, back in history. So uh, what a pleasure to hear what everyone has said and to know that we are in a community that understands each other. And I think some of you are just as tired as I am that people are not getting what we're talking about. Um, so one critical goal of my own research has been to try to help build the bridges already underway I don't mean every physician, just the ones I ran into when my parents were dying. Um, or my dad was dying when my mother was sick. Um, but there are bridges already underway among musicians, music therapists, uh, practitioners like Billy, like uh, all the people we've talked about, uh, they talk to physicians and some physicians are getting it. I mean, for heaven's sakes, Andrew Weil is a physician, right? Um, but uh, it, it doesn't seem common enough. So I'm trying to build that bridge, and I want to give a caveat, and that is that I'm not a scientist. I was going to make a hat, 
and put, I am not a scientist on it because I'm having an argument with the person, uh, the entity who's going to publish my book, I think, because it, uh, uh, somebody thinks that I'm trying to sound like I'm too much of a scientist. So there are a couple of, but wait a minute, slides in my presentation so you know that I'm doing that. When I get my hat, I'll, I'll have a picture of it and I'll put it up the, on the back of my book. <laughs> Anyway, I am qualified, I think, to talk about the bridge on the musical shore. And I do my best on the scientific side. And so anytime I talk about a scientific study and my interpretation of it, I want to remind you that scientific citations are invit invitations to look further. They are uh, invitations to participate in cautious and deliberate speculation about what we know and what, how it adds up with the new neuroscience. And I urge you to talk to a medical professional if you know that your loved one who has some form of dementia is better after their music therapy. I'm not a music therapist, I'm an idea person. But talk to people and I think that will go uh, a long way together. Um, to conclude, I'm gonna save time, I'm not reading. Um, I'm, I'm just going to show my slides and, and, and I think you'll get what we're after. But then I want to save time at the end of the presentation to, to see what other people have been doing. Uh, the world is full of smart people who are, have been marginalized, um, who have been punished just for being alive. And um, America's original sin, the slave trade, is one prime example of that, but people have done that to people forever, and there are people, watch out when you enslave a bunch of creative people, because they will come along and change the face of popular music in the United States forever, and that's what happened. Um, <clears throat> you all know what um, music therapists do. These are just a few of the things, and now these are uh, reports that are coming up in the indexing services like PubMed, uh, in Psych Info. You find the, the music therapy journals being indexed, and that was not always the case, maybe even 10 years ago. Music therapy journals were indexed in the music journals, and the hard science uh, uh, journals were indexed in PubMed, and um, and those kinds of things. And now you're finding, that I am finding in this 10 years worth of research I've done in this, that these, uh, uh, I even have an article that's cited in PubMed, <laughs> uh, indexed in PubMed, so you know, there you go. Um, but um, these and many more afflictions can be ameliorated through um, singing. And today I'm gonna try to keep focusing on singing. Um, this is probably a picture from Dan Levitin's book, This Is Your Brain on Music. Um, and I do have a slide later that talks about how disputed these areas are. And I know Melinda and the others know that. I mean, we can say, well, this is Broca's area and this is what Broca's area does. But that's one of the, thing, one of the things that I'm determined that nobody can uh, invalidate or dismiss my research because I got too big for my britches or said, well, this is definitely where this happens when in fact Every brain is different. And I learned that with my mother. They're not quite sure why she can still spell like an A student, but she can't remember much. And, and um, she calls me by my sister's name, even though she sees me three or four times a week. Um, so, you know, we don't know. And everybody's different. It has to do with handedness. If you're right handed and you have a stroke, it's, it's amazing. So anyway, you, don't, you can't look at this, but get Dan Levitin's book. Um, and you can see that there are some cool places that music involves. As a matter of fact, as we've been saying all weekend, music and, and in my, I really want to talk about singing. Singing activates your whole brain. Um, just a little bit about the history of brain mapping, since that's what I advertised that I was going to talk about. Um, these guys, Paul Broca located the speech centers in 1862. Um, Jean-Baptiste Bouillot, the musical center of the brain in 1865. Salman Henshin in 1902, where a musia sometimes resides. How did those guys figure that out? 
They had to wait till people died. And they did a postmortem on the brain. And that was uh, what a lot of people call the lesion system. So they would do a postmortem and they'd see where the lesions were, just like today's Alzheimer's. We can't really know if somebody has Alzheimer's until they do the postmortem. And then we see the lesions and say, oh yeah, their dementia was of the Alzheimer's type. So they were sort of shooting in the dark, and then the cooler stuff, uh, at least less invasive, uh, Petra was right when she said, if you've ever been in an MRI tube, you don't really think an MRI is not invasive. <laughs> but imagine having a portion of your, your skull cut away um, and have pe having people put electrodes on the surface of your brain. And that's, uh, so uh, neurostimulation in life patients was this great advance in the 1950s. Now we don't have to wait for patients to die to find out what was happening. And then of course all the things, and we probably all, I had an MRI on, a, on my wrist one time and it was like three hours and it took that long because I couldn't be still when that huge noise happened. You know, they had the earphones on me and I would do this every time, you know, so. Uh, it, it's a, it, it is incredibly invasive. Now you're finding scientific journals saying, here's how music therapy works. We've been wondering about music therapy, but here's some ways that music therapy works. One, it captures attention and it distracts from symptoms such as pain. Well, that's a cheap kind of gimme, right? Uh, I could do that. I could play music or sing and distract somebody. That's not really search. Uh, that's not really therapy. They also, a music therapist can change the emotional outlook. They can, change, they can change what's going on in the limbic system. The difference between my mom when she gets to, there's one thing she will not miss, and it's music therapy with Anna Maria on Wednesdays. And I have to arrange my teaching schedule, so by golly, mama gets to music therapy. When she comes out, she's more fluent linguistically. She is joyous. She's standing taller. She is more like my mother after music therapy. Um, it changes, we don't have to say that, you've heard that enough, it changes cognition, it changes memory, it changes behaviors like walking, and it positively affects communication. Michael Taut, uh, our colleague from Colorado State, uh, a few uh, minutes north of here, uh, talks about the fact that uh, he did one study on singing and speaking, and he says, because singing naturally involves more areas of the brain, yet another picture, um, those tasks create memories that are more resilient to neurological effects than non-musical memory. So, not surprising, this is, this, I'm preaching to the choir as always, and um, I covet your responses to what I say. Um, think about, you, think about this being a room full of pre-med students. I want to indoctrinate them early. <laughs> you know, I, 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 in this team talk course that I did at UMKC um, on music and healing, I tried to get Marjorie Searich, who is uh, one, she, she has ch she changed me, this one of the hematologists, oncologists, and I said, Marjorie, for one of our activities, let's, um, let's have an um, improvisatory thing where I come in with a bunch of musicians and we have a score, we have a bunch of different musicians interpret the score variously. And then you bring in a patient who's gonna role play a bunch of symptoms. And you and Loretta and some other physicians who are on the team, you give different diagnoses based on your perspective. She said, we can do that. I said, why not? That's what doctors do. She said, we cannot tell undergraduates that there's more than one way to diagnose a patient. Now, there's this incredibly free-thinking woman who founded, and I said, come on, come on, we're talking about interpretation here, you know, and when the lung guy came in and said something to my dad, when the cancer guy came in, he said something else, when the pulmonary therapist came in, when the, uh, they all said different things, and I just wanted to put them around a table together, she said, we can't do that. I'm sorry. So, um, so there is, we, we, we somehow have to make sure that it's going to be okay for us to talk about this as maybe not exactly exact science, which I know is what makes physicians get a little nervous. Heck, do I want somebody improvising on my husband when he had a lymphoma? No, I want the, the best science out there. But I also want the lung guy to 
to think about it before he walks into my dad's surgery the day after he had a huge, he was open from front to back and had a drainage tube and the guy walks in and says, well, your lungs are nothing to write home about. <laughs> you know, I saw my father. It wasn't just that, it wasn't just what he said, it was the tone of voice. And so I think that there's a way we can build sensitivity. Um, Melinda and colleagues talked about, um, talked about neuroplasticity, so I'm just gonna fly. I, I think I'll just fly through this. But I gotta show you this slide because it's animated. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new thing for me. I animated that. <laughs> so, Michael Tao and Peterson and others set re measured brain activities and memorization success when subjects used verbal memory along the study word list, and then when the same words were studied as lyrics to a song. Anybody grew up in Montessori school? North America, South America, Africa, Europe, and Asia. Don't forget Antarctica. Don't forget Australia. These are the continents. These are the continents. These are the continents of the world. And yes, uh, as we just learned, the brain can recruit other areas if that memory was laid down with a melody and with rhythm. And Michael Tao is a lot about rhythm, as many of you know. Um, I'll let you read that, and I'm not going to try to interpret that. I think I know what it means for me. In my layman's uh, term, it seems that, uh, and actually he says again, um, this first evidence that external rhythm as a temporal structure in music may drive internal rhythm formation in recurrent cortical networks. So you can see then why um, rhythm seems to be important. So that's pretty difficult for me to conceptualize this whole idea of temporal coherence in multiple and coupled neuronal cell assemblies. But if I think about uh, a set of electronic electric relay switches, um, then it seems to me that music's time-based structure has beneficial effect on, if I think about our, sorry, if cognition is imagined as a series of electric relay switches, then singing helps achieve optimal timing of the relays. And I, I'm going to have a physician read this. But I think that that is at least one way for me to understand this whole timing and neuronal cell assemblies. Uh, finally, Tout and his colleagues gave similar memory tasks, singing a list versus memorizing a list, to multiple sclerosis patients, a vexing pathology. And in this path-breaking study, they say what they said they did there on the slide, which is really amazing since the disease affects and interrupts network dynamics of neuronal cell assemblies. So it seems to me to be a pretty darn big deal. All these studies notwithstanding, and there are many more, um, brain plasticity uh, with singing seems to be um, being, uh, um, there seems to be more research on brain plasticity with Bird's own research, as we heard last night. Um, which finch was it? The zebra. The zebra finch that is born knowing could be able to do anything but eventually prunes its um, neuronal assemblies to just the song of the father. There are, there are wonderful uh, sources out here. And actually, people like to do a lot of uh, plasticity uh, research um, on instrumental music too because of that strong physical component and rhythmic one and as you probably know that um, the, this uh, triennial conference that's put on by a bunch of uh, entities including the New York Academy of Sciences, the Marini Foundation in Italy and others, their third big conference was on disorders and plasticity, the neurosciences and music so we're, they're, we're really far along with these. I'm not going to play that. If you're interested, that's Wild Thrush 
wildmusic.org, animals, thrush. The cool thing is, we don't have time to go there, but there are bird songs recorded on this website, and you can slow them down, and when you slow them down, they sound like Native American flute. Oh. Oh. Which is, of course, one of the sources of the Native American flute and legend, right? <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I mean, the, the, there was a dream, and uh, a person saw a bird sitting on um, a uh, tree branch that had holes in it, and the wind was blowing through the trees, and he, grew, he, he woke up and he made a flute. That's how the flute was given to humans. Okay, but onward. I'm talking about, I talked a little bit about plasticity. I want to talk a little bit more about the mirror neuron system, which I'll call the mirror system since I'm a little aphasic when it comes to that mm -hmm. term. And then I'll talk a little bit about oxytocin uh, and how am I doing for time. Okay. So I need, I have about 20 minutes or something maybe. Can you all hang with me for 20 minutes? Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll fly through this. So the mirror neuron system, um, a group of neuroscientists, physiologists in Parma, Italy, noticed that a cer certain neurons in the brain of a macaque monkey fired when it reached for food, but also when the animal observed a person pick up the food. In similar fashion, human infants readily imitate facial expressions, mirror movements, or mimic sounds. Um, <laughs> so Molnar, Sakash, and Overy um, have proposed a mechanism allowing an individual to understand, this is really crucial, understand the meaning and intention of a gesture uh, just because of the response of the mirror neuron system. <coughs> you ever cried when you watched someone else cry? Right. And then I, I'll warn you, if you are really into one-year-old human baby rights, this may uh, frustrate you a little bit, but notice that this is not the baby that's crying, okay? Uh, and we'll hope that this actually shows up on the screen. <laughs> okay. Here's Mark, Daddy, and a one hour old Lyra trying to play the tongue sticking out game. I'm going to stick my tongue out and we'll see if Lyra's going to copy me. Purposeful, intentional, organized stimuli. This 
image. This is the image of, um, of the last goblet vibrating in sympathy with a opera uh, singer's voice or undampened piano strings vibrating when your dog barks. That's as close as I can get to understanding this whole synchronous recruitment. I mean, our brains are full of waves, aren't they? It would make sense. So Kelch and others were talking about um, these mirror mechanisms are relevant for music therapy because they serve in the learning, the understanding, the prediction of actions. And they help patients with neurologic disorders. I wanted you to see this picture. This is a great example of how we have to be careful when we talk about where Broca's area is and where Wernicke, Wernick's area. Is Young Ching still in the room? Or did she go? I think she's left. Okay. She was talking about this in the first paper yesterday. I can't read, but those are authors' names and colors. And so those are the those are the different places that people have located Broca's area, what's supposed to be responsible for aphasia in uh, Wernicke's area. And so we have to be cautious. I mean, that makes sense, doesn't it? We're, we can be cautious as we make uh, suggestions about what happens where. And then this very same article that uh, she cited yesterday, as a matter of fact, I was talking to Melinda about this, we all read the same articles and find something else in them. It's pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> so with the mirror neuron system, if there's a, a relative weakness in expression, expressive language, but there's strength in musical skills, then the mirror neuron system engaged by those things that we've been talking about and through uh, uh, a therapeutic system called auditory motor mapping training, which you can read about. Schlaug is the great guru of this kind of work and he's at Harvard. And so these people are, are clustered around him at Harvard. Um, you can see singing to encourage vocal output. And finally, the goal to improve expressive language function, verbal communication, and social interaction. I'm going to have to skip the part about uh, uh, stammering because I think we could sort of get there. But what? Uh, so I'm going to skip through a bunch of slides in a minute. But those of you who are therapists and work with uh, young children these days, what population of people would be helped by a therapy that gets them to improve expressive language function, verbal communication, social interaction, and reading the intentions of others. Does that ring a bell with anybody? Autism. Oh, the autism spectrum, right? Right. I was going to say teenagers. Oh, my <laughs> God. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Just, just, your, just your basic teenager. Yeah. Um, let me just also, find also my adopted from another country too. I think. That said, you know, I mean, also children that were adopted at a young age from another country too. That, you know, those are um, uh, again. I think those are really individual journeys, and um, you find kids. You, you, uh, there, that's a whole other paper. I'd love to to talk about that, but um, my 16-year-old probably wouldn't give me permission to. Um, <laughs> I, it, it is true. There's this whole business now. So the mirror neuron system and autism spectrum disorder. So the things that are uh, uh, deficient in autism are um, understanding someone else's intentions, empathy, language, and self-representation. Um, oh, another animated slide. Um, the MNS may be su sufficiently engaged with children with on the uh, autism spectrum disorder to move from the appreciation, appreciation of musical sound patterns. I've known a lot of kids on the ASD, on the uh, uh, autism spectrum, who are really drawn to music. And, and people are uh, supposing that being drawn in that way to music can help them understand interpersonal interaction. Probably the most famous uh, person with autism today. So she's really strong 
uh, on those left ladder, lateral ventricles. So she's a real verbal person, but she says when people talk to talk when people ask me questions, the answers are in pictures. So um, Molnar Sakash again said that music improvements increased appropriate social behaviors, decreased inappropriate stereotypical. This, by the way, this list is not associated with Temple Grandin. Um, this is a, a different study, but I'm showing you her as the rock star of autism. Um, increased communicative acts and engagement with others, among other positive effects. And um, Heaton and colleagues said there need to be more studies, scientific, of course. Uh, researchers highlight the need for studies in musical emotion processing. So finally, um, the brain hormone oxytocin. That's sort of a rendering of it, and, and that's the feel-good chemical. I was engaged in a study uh, on oxytocin. This is another reason I'm pretty cautious when I give scientific reports, because we got the IRB permission to draw blood out of music majors 30 minutes before an instrumental rehearsal, 30 minutes after. And the people who promised that they could extract the, uh, the plasma oxytocin found out they couldn't after we got all our blood samples. So the, the technology um, for extracting oxytocin is not where it needs to be yet, but there are a couple of promising studies. And all these studies do are support what we know as musicians already. Um, Oxytocin, whose name stems from quick birth in, in Greek, was isolated and synthesized in 1953, um, and it won Vincent de Duvignot of the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1955. Uh, it's generated in the hypothalamus, and it acts as a central neurotransmitter, neuromodulator, and peripheral hormone, and can affect gene expression and local blood flow, um, among other things. Um, so there's the hypothalamus. This is my favorite slide. Oxytocin has persisted in vertebrates and invertebrates for at least 700 million years, with few modifications. So here's a chart, partial chart from my book. So you understand that 400,000 million years ago, life appeared on Earth, and 505 million years ago were the first vertebrates. But before that, evolutionary biologists say there was oxytocin. So what's so central about oxytocin? Um, during the first 60 odd years since it was discovered, oxytocin was uh, associated only with sexual arousal, pregnancy, birth lactation, postpartum mother-child bonding. So it's necessary to keep the human race going. Um, a woman named Sue Carter said the association between oxytocin and childbirth long kept scientists from taking it seriously. That's a whole topic for my gender class, right? Well, if it has to do with women and childbirth, that's, taken, that's a system that's taking care of itself. We really don't need to talk about it. Um, but as a matter of fact, people have. And um, she says that uh, it became important when people started trying to figure out how a good investment manager gets an investor to trust him with his money. And, and there is, there's an upsurge in oxytocin when we do lots of things. Um, oxytocin is expressed uh, after contact with people that uh, trusted beings and that uh, mitigate the fight flight response, that thing that we're all born with, that I don't like what doesn't look like me, that some people don't get over their entire lives and others of us figure out how to get over that. Um, significantly, McDonald and McDonald notes several studies reporting success with using a nasal spray containing oxytocin with post-traumatic stress disorder patients. So it boosts the good feeling. There's nothing harder to get progress on than PTSD, I'm told. So that's uh, significant. Neighboring colleagues talk about paternal sensitivity to a child with autism. And I should say also, the whole invitation of males into the birthing room uh, gives males the opportunity to have the oxytocin boost too. It, it is a chemical thing 
uh, with mother and baby, it uh, crosses the umbilical cord, but baby and mom are both producing oxytocin. As a matter of fact, those of you who have given birth may have been given a synthetic form of oxytocin, pitocin, to get those contractions going. Um, but fathers also get an upsurge in oxytocin because the room's flowing with oxytocin. And so this is not a female-only hormone. Um, the famous study is by Christina Grave, Torres Garrell, and others at the Stress Research Section of the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. This was done in 2002. And they tested serum concentrations of oxytocin in two experimental groups, amateur and professional singers, and found that the they all had gotten an upsurge of oxytocin after singing lessons. In self-reporting measures, both uh, said that they felt relaxed and energetic after their lessons. Sorry. Um, cortisol, in the same study, cortisol collected 30 minutes before and 30 minutes after the singing lesson decreased after the lesson in the amateur group, but not the professional group. They were mad at themselves for not doing better in the lesson, I guess. <laughs> And then in the 2009 study, these people are not giving up, despite the, this whole problem with the extraction of oxytocin from the blood or from, you can get a salivary oxytocin too, but it's really hard to pull out. Um, choir singing once a week induces a state of stimulated regeneration during the first half year in irritable bowel syndrome patients. So I'm telling everybody I know, get back in choir. You know when you graduate choir and you don't sing anymore? <laughs> when I became a musicologist, I, um, I stopped making music. I came to see you and I, I had a master's degree in piano performance. And I had done church music and I was, I was just too darn serious. I had to read books and write articles. And I was a TA and, and I got really depressed. So I tell my students in my music and healing class, don't give up music. You've got to keep doing something, and singing's not such a bad thing. <coughs> so what can be done? This is my summary. What can we do to cross, to close down this gulf? Oh, I think I want to tell you one more thing. Yeah, I need, uh, I may not be able to find it. Okay, I'll give up on that. That's what happens when you skip around. Okay. So what can be done? Um, these medical findings provide a backdrop for understanding why singing works in stressful situations. Here are a couple uh, of situations that inspire me, and I bet they're going to inspire you. Um, start clearing your throat. We're going to sing. Um, in a, in a, <clears throat> a book called Doing Something Different, Tarana Nelson offered a collection of stories by solution-focused practitioners of counseling therapy. Um, a handful of the 76 stories in this book reference something called the miracle question. For example, imagine that a miracle will occur tonight and when you arrive at work tomorrow, all your problems with your boss will be resolved. What is the first thing you will notice about the atmosphere at work that will indicate the miracle has occurred? And Mark Mitchell uh, submitted this article uh, he was uh, talking to a bunch of teenagers in 1991 at the, uh, around the LA riot, uh, the riots in Los Angeles. And one student said, I'll know a miracle has happened if we had gotten past this stuff riding on campus and we're singing. And Mitchell said, and what would we be singing that would tell us the miracle was starting to happen? The student said, we would be singing, we shall overcome. So Mitchell says, I suggested that we try singing the song. The group responded and sang. It was very emotional and dramatic. So in this situation, I'm going to suggest it will take half a second, um, OK, half a minute. And uh, imagine that when you woke up tomorrow, the government would no longer be shut down. <laughs> I assume they didn't resolve that last night, right? I didn't look at the news this morning. OK, so let's assume that Let's, we wake up and that's going to happen. So let's say that the thing that's going to jump into our minds and it's going to, people are going to be okay moving ahead in whichever direction you want the country to go. 
Uh, you see that, and you see it because everybody's singing We Shall Overcome. Can we sing just one quick verse of We Shall Overcome? We shall all 